Good morning, Brownsburg Baptist Church. I hope you had a good week. I uh, ask you to stand and sing with us as we start our worship service. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me, who caused his pain, for me, who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that Thou, my God, shouldst die for me? He left His Father's throne above, so free, so infinite His grace. Emptied himself of all but love And bled for Adam's helpless race Tis mercy all immense and free For oh my God it found out me Amazing love, how can it be that Thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flame with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amazing love, how can it be that Thou, my God, shouldst die for me? No condemnation now I dread, Jesus and all in Him is mine. Alive in Him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne, and claim the crown through Christ my own. Amazing love, how can it be that Thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Before we sing our next song, uh, which is Grace Greater Than All Our Sin, I wanted to read a passage of Scripture, Romans 5, 20 and 21, if I can pull it up here. Um, it says, Moreover, the law entered, that the offense might abound. But where grace, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. It shows our that grace is that Christ gives death is greater than our sin. And just want to think about that when we sing these words. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mound outpoured. There where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. 
Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace. Freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see His face, will you this moment His grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, Grace that is greater than all our sin. Grace singing, you may be seated as Pastor comes. I thought we had more and more verse to sing, so I was still hanging out down there. Aren't you glad for God's grace being greater than our sin? Wouldn't it be awful for someone to ask the Lord to forgive them and the Lord say, oh, your sins are too great to forgive. I can't do that. Uh, we know better than that. Amen. Uh, Brother Jim has a little sign that often says that or that always says that God has never seen a sinner that he did not love and he's never seen a sinner that he did not uh, that he could not save. That ought to encourage your heart today, right? Because God loves you. God created you. God made you. And uh, he is uh, certainly uh, here today for us to, I Facebooked people this morning and I said, hey, today's a special day because it's a day where we meet together. It's a day where we fellowship together. It's a day where we lift up Christ together. And uh, I hope that that's what your heart is today. Uh, thankful for those who are visiting with us here today, and uh, we had multiple people visiting uh, here today. We have multiple people on vacation, just in case you, I know you guys know that, right? And so uh, several people are away. Um, the Barnes family, uh, Mike and Linda, they're celebrating their 51st wedding anniversary. I told him they don't look that old. Uh, but anyway, they're celebrating that. Lonnie and Gala decided to go on a three-week hiatus, and so uh, they're away today. Justin and Jenna closed on a house. He's trying to paint it, so he took vacation uh, this week, and then I'm sure there are some people that are traveling because it's uh, Labor Day weekend, so uh, we have a lot of our own folks that are not here today, but we're here. You're here. I'm here, and uh, we're going to Enjoy a message today. I hope uh, that uh, I've entitled, Somebody Ought to Testify. Somebody Ought to Testify. And let me just add to that. If somebody ought to testify, it might as well be you. Just think about that. All right. Glad to have you here today. The Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. 
How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away. As words which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ. His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Stand with us once again as we sing our last song. Uh, Speak, O Lord. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the fruit of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness. That the light of Christ might be seen today In our acts of love and our deeds of faith Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us All your purposes for your glory Teach us, Lord, full obedience, holy reverence, true humility. Test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity. Cause our faith to rise, cause our eyes to see Your majestic love and authority Words of power that can never fail Let their truth prevail over unbelief Speak, O Lord, and renew our minds. Help us grasp the height of your plans for us. True sun change from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity. And by grace we'll stand on your promises. And by faith we'll walk as you walk with us. Speak, O Lord, till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. Grace singing, you may be seated.
the Gospel of John, chapter number 1. The Gospel of John, chapter number 1. I shared an introductory message uh, with you. We began toward the end of the book uh, last week because John tells us precisely and exactly why he wrote the book. It's always nice to know why God writes a book, isn't it? Would you agree with that? It's always good to know why he wrote the book. And he wrote the book that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And so he wants you to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus Christ is, is the Savior of, of mankind, and uh, that you would eventually believe on him. You know, it doesn't matter if you believe that Jesus is real if you've never received him. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You haven't made any difference. It hasn't made any difference in your life. And so Jesus Christ, what is he? What is he? We're going to learn some things as we go on Sunday mornings through the gospel of John. But let me say, he's the Lord of all. He's the Lord of all. There's no one that has ever conquered Christ. Satan has even tried and failed. He's the Lord of heaven. He's the Lord of earth. He's the Lord of the mountains. He's the Lord of the valleys. He's the Lord of the land. He's the Lord of the seas. He's the Lord of the wind. He's the Lord of the rain. He's the Lord of the entire universe. That's who Jesus is. One day, the Bible tells us, every knee will bow. Every knee. Not some knees. One day, every knee, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm thankful for that, aren't you? Everything in all of creation will bring forth the the grand station of Jesus himself. They'll bring forth the royal diadem and, and we will crown him Lord of all. So in chapter 1, and verse number 1, we're going to examine five verses here today. And again, my message title is, Someone or Somebody Ought to Testify. I got a question. Did you speak to anyone about Jesus this past week? Did you even speak his words, his name to anyone? We need to think about that, don't we? If we haven't, we should repent of that. We should be excited to share Christ with others. Just to speak about Christ, not not, let alone to witness to someone else about Christ. It's a reality today that God's church has not been testifying the way that it should. And so, for 21 chapters in our Bible, in the book of John, John serves as a witness, and he is under a divine oath. You know what witnesses say? You know what they're asked? They're asked, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? They put their hand on a Bible still, even today. And with that, and, and with one hand on the Bible, one uh, hand in the air, they say what? That I will. I promise that I will. So John serves as a witness under divine oath as he gives testimony about the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, in John 21, 24, John writes Uh, here, and he speaks of himself, he refers to himself as a witness who had not only testified, but had entered a true testimony. Sometimes people testify falsehoods. But what John said is, you can count on my testimony. My testimony is true. So he doesn't force you to merely take his word for it. 
He begins to use this gospel to call other witnesses and enter other evidence. The more witnesses you have, the greater your case. Would you agree? We're looking for witnesses. We're wanting to find witnesses. I have a handout that we're going to give at the end of this service uh, that will speak about these realities. But I want you to see that John records seven signs as a witness of the very fact that Jesus Christ is God. Seven signs. You'll get these. You don't have to write them down. You'll get them when you leave if you want them. If you don't want them, then we'll save them here. But anyway, seven signs. What did Jesus do? His very first miracle in John chapter 2, he turned the water into wine. Remember at that marriage? And so Jesus turned water into wine. Chapter number 4, he healed the son of a nobleman. Chapter 5, he heals a lame man at the pool of of, uh, uh, Bethesda. Chapter 6, there are two miracles recorded that he performs. He walks on water. That's where he invited Peter to join him. He walks on water and he feeds the 5,000. John chapter number 9, you remember Jesus healed the man born blind? He healed the man born blind and then in chapter 11, the miracle of all miracles, his friend Lazarus had died. And he stood at the tomb, he wept because it was his friend, even though he was going to bring him forth from the grave, he was weeping, I think, with the family and about the circumstance itself. These words, Lazarus, come forth. And what happened? Remember what happened? Lazarus came out of the grave. He'd been in the grave four days. The Jews believed that on the fourth day that corruption of the body began, decay of the body began. And they said, oh, Lord, by now he stinketh. That didn't hold the Lord back. God can take care of the stench and he can also raise the dead. Amen. What a blessing. So John records seven signs as evidence. John recruits seven saints, seven saints as character witnesses to prove that Jesus is the Christ. John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. In John chapter number 1, John chapter 1 verse 49, Nathanael proclaims, thou art the Son of God. In John 6, 69, Simon Peter, he said, We believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. John 7, 41, there was a crowd that testified, This is the Christ. John eleven twenty seven, 27, Martha, one of the two sisters of Lazarus, said, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Thomas, the doubter, sees the nail prints in the hands and the uh, sword that had pierced his side. And Thomas, the doubter, proclaimed, My Lord and my God. Jesus is the Christ, isn't he? And then finally, John himself proclaims in John 20, 31, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. John recounts seven statements from the star witness himself. The star witness is Jesus. The star of the Bible is Jesus, in case you were wondering. And Jesus himself is the, is, is the prime witness. In John 6, 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. In John 8, verse number 12, he said, I am the light of the world. In John 10, 9, he said, I am the door. There aren't multiple doors. He is the door to heaven. 
John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. Not just the shepherd, but he's the good shepherd. John eleven twenty five. 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 15, 1, Jesus would have to testify that he indeed is the true vine. He's the true vine. So the Holy Spirit, this it's important because the inspired lawyer of all of this is God himself. He calls all of these to testify, but it all begins with a profound opening statement in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Do you hear the testimony today? The only time I've ever been a witness in a legal matter, don't run out of here, please. The only time that I've been a witness in a legal matter involved an occasion in which I had a murderer, yes, a murderer knock on the door of the parsonage. I know, that drives you crazy, doesn't it? I mean, who can start with a traffic accident? I've got to go right to the murder. As I gave the report to the police, they wanted to know every detail of the incident. What did he say? What was he wearing? Where was he at? How cold was it? Wanted to know every detail. And so I was, I was a witness. I became, as a matter of fact, I was the very first witness that they spoke to because I was the very first person that he had seen after he murdered his adopted father. But here we have an incident, we have a witness, here we have details that are so phenomenal because John begins to testify about what he saw and what he knew, and really he witnessed what we would call this cosmic collision of heaven and earth. Hey, the greatest thing that's ever hit this planet is Jesus Christ. The greatest thing that's ever come here is Jesus Christ. Now John begins to testify about the identity of the person who caused this merciful collision of God with man. So I want you to see this today. Number one, we see that John testified, John testified that Jesus is the God of glory. That Jesus is the God of glory. He is the God of glory. John dispenses with the details offered by Matthew and Luke. Matthew and Luke, we have, we have the shepherds. We have the wise men. We have a manger. We have the details of a birth. John goes right to the point and and uh, dispenses of that which was offered by Matthew and Luke with an economy of words. John gets right to the point. He speaks about his age. How old is Jesus? He's even older. I'm looking around here. That's right. He's even older than Jim Ray. You know, the oldest man in the Bible, his name was Methuselah. We were going through the Creation Museum once. My brother Eddie was there with us. And uh, it, was, uh, it was one of these uh, movement turned it on, you know. And so I don't even know what you call it, but it, it, it looked like a real person. And so we walked in that little hallway, and, and uh, this guy goes, ha, 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 ha. My name's Methuselah. My brother Eddie almost went through the roof when that happened. And he said, I am the oldest recorded man in the Bible. I live to be 969 years old. And it was possible at that point, and here's why most people don't understand this, the earth was 
wrapped in a canopy that kept the ultraviolet rays from hitting the earth the way that it did. We call that the anti-A-N-T-E diluvian age. And so people lived longer back then. And so Methuselah was 969 years old. You know what? That's a drop in a bucket when we talk about Jesus. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning. As far back as you can go in time, Jesus has always been there. And so how old is this Christ? He's older than Methuselah. He's older than the world that we live in. He's older than the cosmos. Because in the beginning was the word. It's an interesting question. If we could put some things here in front of you for a moment. Uh, you know, if someone were to say, well, well, how old? How old? What is the age of the one that John was speaking? He, he might have to say something like this. Well, it's an interesting question, and it's kind of hard to answer. Because uh, it really depends on if you're talking about on his mother's side or on his father's side. You see, on his mother's side, Jesus was about 33 years old when he died. But on his father's side, he's from everlasting to everlasting. On his mother's side, he was born about 4 B.C. On his father's side, he is the uncreated God of eternity past. On his mother's side, he was born into time. On his father's side, time was birthed by him. Literally, in the beginning was the word. That's why there's no birth, there's no bloodline, and no Bethlehem. There's no star, there's no stable, there's no shepherds to John. Why? Because... In the beginning, before the manger stall, was God. He testifies of that reality before the beginning of the beginning began, Jesus was. That's hard to say. Don't ask me to repeat that. It's no accident that this book begins like Genesis. Genesis 1, in the beginning... God. One writer says that John wrote in Greek, but his style was in Hebrew. He says Jesus is the God of Genesis 1-1. He's part of the Godhead that, that uh, said, let us make man in our image in Genesis 1 and verse number 26. Colossians 1.17, he is before all things. John 8.58, they cast up stones to stone him for this statement. Before Abraham was, I am. They didn't think Jesus was as old as Abraham. In fact, Jesus was older than Abraham a thousandfold at least. Frankly, if you think about it, Jesus is the only person who has ever really been older than dirt. From age to age and from everlasting to everlasting, the eternally existing God of glory is none other than Jesus. So we see his age. We see, secondly, his attributes. Not only in the beginning was the Word, but we see his attributes, and the Word was with God. With is a Greek uh, word that speaks about being face to face. 
on the same level with God. In Philippians 2, 6, Paul says that Jesus existed in the form of God. He wasn't saying he wasn't God. It's a way of saying that he was God. No matter how you looked at him, he was God. I like this. Some, some preacher said, not diet God, not sugar-free God, not God light. He wasn't lactose-free. He wasn't gluten-free. He wasn't organic God. He wasn't 2%. He wasn't 1%. He wasn't skim God. He was holy God. He bled holy blood. He sweat holy sweat. He spoke holy words and he left God's footprints. 100% God, 100% man. That's why we call him the God-man. It's imperative. If This is imperative. If Jesus is the bridge from God to man here on this earth, it's important that we have a way to get there. Jesus is the bridge from earth to heaven. Paul describes this very fact in First Timothy. A bridge has to be able to lay hold to both banks of the river and when it comes to bridging the gulf of sin that exists between God and man, only Jesus can firmly lay hold to the bank of humanity and the banks of deity. Charles Wesley put it like this, he left his father's throne above so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. Amazing love, how can it be? Don't miss this. That thou, my God, shouldst die for me. We see his age. In the beginning was the Word. We see His attributes, and the Word was with God. And then, and then we find His appearance. The Bible says, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. What did He look like? Again, that depends. On His mother's side, He had no stately form, the Bible says, or majesty. But on His Father's side... We beheld his glory, verse 14 of John 1 says. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. If you look with carnal eyes, worldly eyes, he looked like a peasant carpenter. But if God opens your eyes to the gospel, and I hope that God will, he looks like who? He really is. Jesus looks like God. John 14, 8, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. Jesus replied in verse number 9, He that hath seen me has seen the Father. Amen? For you to look into the face of Jesus is for you to peer into the face of God himself. John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. It's interesting. It's interesting. It's not there on the slide, but I wrote it down the way that the Bible shows it. The word my is italicized. Inserted for clarity. Hey, let's take the word my out. I and Father are one. Amen? I and Father are one. Man, that's powerful, isn't it? And we can put the, the uh, italicized word my there 
uh, not because it's in the Greek, but for clarity, he is my father. Jesus and my heavenly father are one. Hebrews 1.3 says Jesus is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. The express image means the image left by a wax seal would be like somebody taking a signet and, and pressing it into wax and you would have a, an, an exact uh, replica of what you are talking about. And so he was the express image. John 17, 22, that they may be one even as we are one, Jesus, in the, in, as he prayed the real Lord's Prayer. Colossians 1.15 says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. You know what the word is there? It's the word icon. Oh, that would work for young people today. It should, at least. When we think of an icon, we may think of a logo, or we may think of an app on our phone or our smart device. When you click on that app, when you tap on that app or swipe on that app, the entire program opens up for you. Jesus is the icon of God. The Bible says if you want to know God, if you want to know God, you know what the Bible tells us there? Just tap on Jesus. Just tap on Jesus. Double click on Jesus. Swipe on Jesus. And everything that God is will open up to you. Through the precious Lord Jesus. Arthur W. Pink, A.W. Pink, wrote, in this book, speaking of John, in this book, we are shown that the one who was heralded by the angels to the Bethlehem shepherds who walked on this earth for four, uh, 33 years, who was crucified at Calvary, who rose in triumph from the grave, and who 40 days later departed from the scene was un- none other than the Lord of glory. The evidence is so overwhelming, the proofs almost without number, and the effect of contemplating them must be to bow our hearts and worship before him. My friend, you get on your knees when you learn that Jesus is the God of glory. And one day, the Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So we learn he's the God of glory. Number two, John testified that Jesus is the Lord of life. He is the Lord of life. Verse number three, notice it here in our text. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Oh, the world says, Big Bang. God says, Jesus. Big Bang, Jesus. Big Bang, Jesus. You know, it takes more faith to believe that a Big Bang made this place than to believe that God who is almighty and all-powerful, that created human life, spoke this world into existence. I'm glad that my Bible tells me that he spoke it into existence. I'm going to believe what God says, not what man says. He's the, fount- the, uh, he's the fountain of creation. Everything's alive. Everything that's alive is alive because of Jesus Christ. Do you remember what he did with Adam? Before Adam ever breathed his first breath, God created him. But then it says, 
that he breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Hey, Adam would still be there lifeless today if Jesus had not breathed into him the breath of life. What do we try to do when someone quits breathing? Huh? Why, why do we have that course that all the preschool teachers take? Someone quits breathing. You know what you try to do? You try to put breath back in them. So they can become a living soul. John 1.10, the world was made by him, is what the Bible says. It doesn't say the world was made by a cataclysmic bang. Hebrews 1.2 says, by whom also he made the worlds. That gives you a little idea of how big he really is. Have you ever thought about how big he is? How big God is? How big Jesus is? Colossians 1.16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Amen. If you look out with a telescope, they tell us that within the Milky Way, there are billions of stars. Billions of stars in the Milky Way. And there are billions of galaxies beyond our own. I'd say he's pretty big, wouldn't you? There are stars that would consume millions of our suns. Do you understand how large our sun is to our solar system? And yet there are stars that would consume millions of our suns. And yet the Bible says God knows them all by name, and he made them all. How powerful is that reality today? The closest star is four and a half light years away. Light traveling at 186,000 miles per second takes four and a half years to get to here from there. The visible universe is 15 billion light years in diameter. And yet Isaiah 40, verse number 12, says that God measures the sky with the span of his hand. That's the width of his hand, from thumb to finger. I'd say he's pretty big, wouldn't you? If you were to look... Uh, Around with a periscope, the volume of water in the oceans, they say, is 1.4 million km3 to, to the third power. So, if, if you took an Olympic-sized swimming pool and turned it into a scoop, the Olympic-sized swimming pool, you turned it into a scoop, scooping one time per second... One time per second, it would take 17 and a half million years to drain the oceans dry. Yet Psalm 94, uh, 95, 4 declares, in his hand are the deep places of the earth. Oh, we always sing that song. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole wide world. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. My friend, he's big. He's big. He's mighty. He's mighty. He's big. You look down with a microscope and what you would learn about this, and Andrew may be able to tell us a little bit more about this, but I am told that you have 10 trillion cells in your body, 10 trillion, not billion, 10 trillion cells, uh, cells in your body, and your DNA is packed in and coiled up so tightly 
that if we uncoiled the DNA from the average human body, your cells would reach to the moon and back 1,500 times. You know who wound that ball up? God did. You see, as far out as you can see and as far as you can tell, everything is held by God. The psalmist said in Psalm 139, 13, For thou hast possessed my reins, that's what you are internally. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. He's the fountain of creation. Secondly, he's the foundation of creation. Without him was not anything made that was made. As the Lord of life, he's not only the person from which creation comes, he's the place upon which creation rests. Again, Hebrews 1.3 upholds all things by the word of his power. Colossians 1.17, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. They're banded together. Jesus is the glue that holds this universe together. And he can hold your life together. He can hold your family together. And he can hold your eternity together. A lady asked her, Pastor, do you think God is concerned about my little problem? He said, Sister, do you think any of your problems are big to God? See, God cares about all of our problems. But he doesn't have a little one or a big one. God can deal with anything, can't he not? He's the foundation of creation. He's the foundation, uh, he, he's the foundation of creation. And we see here, uh, letter C, he's the focus of creation. Him, him, the focus of creation. Would you today give your heart and your life to Jesus Christ? There's a little word that John beats like a drum. You know what it is? Him, him, him. Speaking of Jesus, somebody ought to testify. It's about Jesus, isn't it? Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firm of his handiwork. Show with his handiwork. When you go outside, creation itself is calling out. There is a God, and you need to get to know him. Revelation 4, 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Satan doesn't want Jesus to get any credit or any glory, but he deserves all the glory. Ask the, astron uh, the astronomer, and you'll find that Jesus is the bright and morning star. According to Revelation twenty two sixteen, the baker, he's the bread of life, John six thirty five. Ask the contractor, he's the sure foundation. Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ, first Corinthians three eleven. He's the doctor. I talked to my doctor on Tuesday about the great physician. I just wanted him to know there was somebody smarter than him. Amen. So, uh, he's the healer, Mark 134. He's the engineer, he's the strong tower, Proverbs 18.10. He's the florist, the Bible says he's the lily of the valley. The geologist, he's the rock of ages. He's a historian, the ancient of days, Daniel 7.22. All these would agree, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The, investigra uh, the investigator would agree he is the truth, John 14, 6. He's the jeweler. He's the pearl of great price in Matthew 13, 46. He's the king. He's the king of glory, according to Psalm 24, 7. He's the lawyer. He's our advocate, 1 John 2, 2. He's the mathematician, the first and the last, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He's the nurse. He's the balm of Gilead. He's the orphan. He's the everlasting father. That's the preacher, and he's the word of God. All these would agree Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The quarry worker, the solid rock, Matthew 16, 18. The reporter, the good news, Luke 4, 18. The soldier, he's a mighty warrior, Psalm 24, 8. The teacher, he's the wellspring of wisdom, Proverbs 18, 4. The undertaker, the resurrection and the life, John eleven twenty five. 25. The victim, an avenger 
of all that do evil, 1 Thessalonians 4, 6. All of these would agree that Jesus is the Christ. And then finally, in closing, he's the source of salvation. He's the source of salvation. John testified this, that Jesus is the source of salvation. That means your deliverance, your deliverance from hell. This is the ultimate purpose behind John's writing of this fourth gospel. Look at what he says in verses 4 and 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended or overcame it not. He shares the life of God. In him was life. Life is a prevailing theme in John John 10, 10, the thief cometh not but to kill or to steal and to kill and destroy. I'm come that they might have it what? That they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John 20, 31, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have what? Life through his name. 1 John 2, 25, and this is the promise that he hath promised us. What has he promised us? Even eternal life. He shares the life of God. He shows the love of God. The life was the light of men. Oh, the world needs love today. The world doesn't need dissension, disunity. It needs the love of God that unifies us around the person of Christ himself. He, the life was the light of men. Christ didn't keep the light to himself, the life to himself. He shared it with others out of his great love. And John repeatedly tells us about what? The love of God. The love of God. John 3, 16. Oh, what does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have everlasting life. First John 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. First John 3, 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God how do we perceive it? Because he laid down his life for us. 1 John 4, 9, And this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only son, think about this, he sent his only son, his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Jesus understood that love isn't love until you give it away. We showed some officers last week that we loved them. Jesus knew that love would never be known unless it was given. And he gave that love away as he went to Calvary's cross. He went there for you. He went there for me. He shines the light of God. And the light shines in darkness. And the darkness comprehended, or the idea is overcame it not. Comprehended means overthrown, to overpower, to overcome. I want you to think about this in closing. When darkness came, it could not overthrow the light. When darkness came, it could not overpower the light. When darkness came, it would not overcome the light. Jesus, our John said, light has come into the world. At least three times, John says, I, or Jesus says, I am the light of the world. 1 John 1, 5, John says, God is, is light, and in him is no darkness at all. It's a great analogy because there's, there's not enough darkness in the entire universe to overcome light. All you got to do to overcome darkness is turn every light out in here and strike a match. And all of a sudden, light begins to emanate. It doesn't matter how dark. It doesn't matter how big. Darkness has never overcome light. You can turn on light and you will always chase away darkness. But you can 
you can't ever turn on enough darkness to chase light out of a room. John Peterson spoke of this when he wrote, Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I shall never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling, with joy I am telling, he made all the darkness depart. But you don't have to take John's word for it. The whole Bible is one long deposition testifying about Jesus. From cover to cover, the Bible, from start to finish, the Bible writes, writers all testify he is the God of glory. He is the God of life. He is the source of salvation. Jesus is Lord. I'd like to ask you to bow your heads with me today. We've, we've shared a lot with you here in a short period of time. Thank you for listening so well. But if you haven't heard what I've said, then it really didn't do much good for you. But did you hear today John's testimony? Did you hear what John said about Jesus? I hope so, for if you did... It should cause every single one of us to change our life. It should cause every single one of us to be drawn to him. Father, I pray that you would take the message this morning, use it to draw us to yourself. I pray that you be glorified in and through this moment of time. And I pray, Lord, if any person is here today that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that, Father, you would deal with that need. I ask these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. I'd like for you to look up here. I have some next steps on the, on the screen that I'd like to encourage you about. And today, it's, I want to speak to you if you've never seen Jesus as God if you've never seen him as the savior of your life and of mankind, I want to ask you something. Would you accept him today? I remember hearing a message similar to this, and I wasn't saved. And I responded. I asked Christ to save my soul. And so if you're here this morning, either right here in our building, or if you're watching uh, the live stream service, and you've never, ever accepted and embraced Jesus Christ as God and the Savior of mankind, I trust that you would today, that you would accept Him. Because to see Him as God is to receive Him as your Savior. Otherwise, you would be, you would be unwise. It's foolish to turn your back on God when God is offering himself to you. When God is saying, hey, I understand who you are. And I came to pay for your sin debt and for preachers' sin debt and every other person's. Trust Christ today. Trust him to take away your sin. Take him, to, uh, take him at his word that he will cleanse you, that he will forgive you. Depend upon him to be that bridge that gets you from earth to heaven. And today, if you're here and you're a Christian, you've already accepted Christ as your Savior, I hope you get excited about testifying to others about Jesus because somebody ought to testify. Seek to share the truth about Christ and his love. That's it. To seek to do that and make it a point 
to not let a week go by where you haven't told somebody about Jesus. Let's all stand. I invite you, if, if God has spoken to your heart and I can be a help to you, uh, I'll meet you right down here. And, uh, and uh, you come. If you need to pray, come and pray. Uh, if you uh, need someone to open a Bible and show you how you can know that when you die, you're going to heaven, why don't you come? Let us do that very thing. It's unwise to turn your back on God. It really is. And so I hope today you allow God to have his, his place in your life. Would you come? Anyone have a need today that we can help you with? I trust if you've got a tugging in your heart that you know you should do something, that you will do it. That's the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart.